Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Unlock the Stock with PPC. Unlock the Stock is specifically formulated for retail investors to gain access to corporate management and just to get to know them a little bit better. This event is sponsored by A2X, a stock exchange playing an integral part in the progression of the South African financial markets. A2X is the second largest stock exchange in Africa, as measured by market capitalization. There is no cost, risk, or additional regulation for a secondary listing on A2X, and it provides the issuers investors with an opportunity to save money. A2X currently has 107 securities listed on its platform, including 21 top 40 stocks with a combined market capitalization of 6.5 trillion rand. The team at A2X are proud to be participating in Unlock the Stock, just as it unlocks value through insights and key analysis. A2X unlocks values for the stocks listed on its platform and helps drive the market forward. This platform would not be possible without our technology partner, Lumi Global. Their website is lumiglobal.com and you can visit it to find out more about the various integrated online AGM and investor presentation solutions. Our host today will be the finance ghost and Mark Tobin from Coffee Microcaps, and they will be facilitating the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We would like to welcome Roland van Veenen, the CEO of PPC. Before we commence, just a couple of housekeeping rules. There is going to be a short PPC video, and then Roland will take you through the presentation. After that, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions and you will need to type them in the chat function at the bottom of your screen. The event is being recorded and is available on the Unlock the Stock YouTube channel as with previous events. So please be sure to subscribe to the channel. Andre, if you could share the video, please. Welcome to PPC. We have been empowering people to experience a better quality of life for over 130 years. At PPC, we believe that cement and other building materials we offer aren't about building structures, they're about building communities and improving lives. Our commitment to quality, innovation, and social responsibility has made us one of the leading companies in South Africa with an African footprint. We offer a wide variety of products, including cement, aggregates, ready mix concrete, and more. Our materials have been tried and tested for over 130 years, ensuring quality and longevity in every project we undertake. We are proud to be an industry leader, providing not only the highest quality products, but also technical support to ensure quality workmanship. It doesn't just end there. We are committed to investing in the communities in which we operate, with a range of CSI initiatives that empower local businesses and help grow local economies. We have contributed to building schools, clinics and community centers. We have also supported community projects that create jobs and improve living conditions. We believe in going beyond just selling quality building materials. Our Strength Beyond program offers technical support to ensure quality workmanship. We offer technical educational workshops such as CETA accredited training workshops, bricklaying, plastering and construction management, brick making workshops and contractor workshops. These workshops provide hands-on training to improve the skills of builders and contractors, ensuring that they have the knowledge and skills to use our products correctly. Our quality assured products have been tried and tested for over 130 years. We conduct rigorous testing to ensure our products endure and that our buildings stand the test of time. We have a wide range of products that cater to different needs and preferences. Our products are used in a variety of building projects, from residential houses to large infrastructure projects. PPC is proudly South African with an African footprint. 
we have operations in several African countries, including Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Rwanda. We are committed to being a responsible corporate citizen in all the countries in which we operate. We work closely with local communities to create shared value and contribute to local development. We are proud to highlight everything we have achieved. We are committed to making a difference. We believe that our success is not just measured in financial terms, but also in the positive impact we have on our stakeholders. Thank you for investing in PPC. Your investment helps us make a difference and bringing returns to our investors. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to continuing to build a better future together. PPC, empowering people to experience a better quality of life. That was a stunning overview. So, Roland, it is over to you to share your presentation with us, please, and to give us some deeper insights into PPC. Thank you very much, Vanessa, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you again for the, for the opportunity um, and a chance to present to you PPC in a nutshell. Um, I've been asked to keep the presentation to around 20, 25 minutes uh, so that we have plenty of time for a Q&A session and we can go into the topics that you want to talk about. Um, I'll touch upon three topics. You have seen the introductionary video. Um, we'll then look at the group in its various operations, South Africa and Botswana on one hand, and then Zimbabwe as well as Rwanda. Um, and then a few words on how we see the way forward. PPC, for many of you, a, a very well-known company, um, have been in business since 1892, so now more than 130 years. This slide depicts almost 130 years in a nutshell. Um, as you know, we have grown um, in South Africa until we started a expansion program that led us to various countries outside of South Africa. Uh, Botswana, Zimbabwe, DRC, um, Ethiopia was even on the radar screen. And that period that basically started um, after 2010 um, has led us to a situation around 2018 that we had quite a significant debt um, on our balance sheet. And not all of the projects that we had launched on the continent were bringing us the returns that we had expected. In combination with that, we had the headwinds coming up in South Africa, where, of course, the construction industry took a, um, a major dip downwards after the, the World Cup in 2010. So what we have been busy with over the last um, good four years is a restructuring program, uh, whereby we decided to clearly focus on our core business in South Africa and Botswana. As a consequence of that, uh, we have restructured our business such that we no longer hold a controlling position in uh, the DRC. So that company has been deconsolidated from our balance sheet. We have sold our minority investment in um, Ethiopia, and our current portfolio uh, still contains our position in Rwanda that I will talk about today, Zimbabwe, uh, as well as South Africa and Botswana, of course. With that uh, restructuring program, you will see that our debt has significantly reduced, and now looking forward, uh, we can come back to something that we have high on our priority list, which is restoring dividends or any other form of um, distributions back to our shareholders. You saw in the video that we have a clear purpose, uh, empowering people to experience a better quality of life. But throughout the business, we are of course also very well aware that this does go hand in hand with being a company that focuses on performance. And the picture that you see here um, is something that we use a lot in our company. We recognize on the left-hand side the capital that has been provided to us, either by our shareholders or by external um, lending facilities, the banks, and that needs to come up with a financial return. In the middle of that, um, we look at our customers. Um, of course, we look at having engaged employees and at process excellence, all very well bound by governance and compliance, as well as our corporate social responsibility programs that were touched upon in the, in the video already. A few key considerations that I would like to, to highlight. Um, the first point that I'd like to make is that legacy issues are behind us. Um, you know, in the four years that I have been with PPC, we had to deal with quite a lot of history, um, and that now is closed. So our deleveraging as a consequence is substantially completed. 
We have a clear focus on the Southern African countries, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and South Africa. Legacy issues that we had out of our business in the DRC has been resolved. There are no further claims or recourse of that country or any other country for that matter. The three countries in which we, the three areas in which we operate now, South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe and Rwanda are ring fenced. And I'll touch upon that a little bit later. Clearly that focus on Southern Africa exposes us more than in the past on the challenges that we see in South Africa. Uh, we still see an environment that is highly competitive, a trading environment on the back of the economic um, circumstances that South Africa is confronted with that is muted. Um, that combined with um, high cost inflation, especially over the last 12 months, um, still causes us in terms of capital returns, that our returns on the investments we make, we have made in South Africa are not yet at the levels where we would like to see them. The positive news is that we have good cash flows coming out of uh, Zimbabwe and now also Rwanda that are being repatriated consistently and help generate um, cash within the South African core business. You will have heard uh, most likely that a cement industry is a large emitter of CO2, uh, which is correct. Um, we have a decarbonization program in place. We announced this in November 2021. Um, and I'll briefly touch upon the main levers that we have there and why all those projects also have a cost benefit. So at the moment, the decarbonization program that we run until 2030 is value accretive um, and has a positive impact on our um, on reducing our CO2 emissions. I'd like to say that you know we have worked hard over the last years to have a common culture and a sound performing team across all jurisdictions. Cement business is a local business. Uh, we have cement operations across South Africa, and it is important for us that we have strong management, for example, in the Western Cape, that we have strong management in Botswana, in Zimbabwe, and so on and so forth. With the deleveraging that we focused on over the last years, you will see the picture on the right, that in the period 2019 to 22, most of the cash that we generated uh, was either used for capital investments to maintain our equipment or for debt repayment. Going forward, uh, we see that shifting. Now that we have the right uh, leverage in place throughout our business, we will focus on distributions to shareholders and of course, um, allocating capital to the maintenance of our core business. The way we look at our business is in, is in buckets. Uh, that doesn't sound very nice, but um, uh, allow me to explain this. On the left-hand side of the slide, you see our South African bucket, uh, what we refer to as the SA Obligo Group. That contains our South African and Botswana cement footprint that I will unpack a little bit later. Um, and it also includes our materials business. And materials is three businesses in one. It is ready mix concrete, ash, and aggregates. And I will touch upon these businesses a little bit later as well. Underneath there, you see group services and PPC Limited. Uh, these are um, entities that provide services, management and technical services to all our businesses, also Zimbabwe and Rwanda. And it is also the entity that will collect the dividends that are flowing back in from Zimbabwe and Rwanda. When we look at the leverage that we are um, aiming for within the SA Obligo Group, we're looking at a leverage of about 1.3 to 1.5 times gross debt to EBITDA. That EBITDA includes dividends that we're receiving from Zimbabwe and Rwanda. And we will, um, as we announce our results for FY23, be able to inform the market in June that we have achieved the optimal leverage of 1.3 to 1.5. Then we have the bucket of Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabwe has its own board, own management team. Uh, we own 70% at the moment. Um, in practice, it means that we have 93% of the economic benefits because of the structure that we put in place as part of the indigenization programs that we um, had to put in place in Zimbabwe a number of years ago. Some of these will unwind um, in the course of the next financial year. Rwanda, we own 51%, also a company with its own board. It's listed on the Rwandan Stock Exchange. And it's very pleasing to let you know that the first dividend uh, was declared in February this year. And in the meantime, has reached our bank accounts in, in South Africa. So both Rwanda and Zimbabwe are positively contributing through the group, through their um, regular dividend payments. 
this is the picture of the deleveraging, as you can see, from the 31st of March 2021, all the way up to our prediction on the 31st of March 2023. You see a steady decline of our net debt position um, and our current net debt position uh, that we expect to reach at the end of this month sits between 725 and 775 million rents, which for us is a level that we feel very comfortable with. Therewith, the resumption of these distributions to shareholders will become an option uh, that is clearly on our radar screen going forward. The way we look at capital allocation um, and the way we measure ourselves is that we look at return on invested capital. Due to the hyperinflation accounting that is being applied to the Zimbabwean accounts, um, I do never encourage anyone to look at our earnings or headline earnings. They are heavily impacted by so-called non-cash items that are largely coming from the hyperinflation accounting that we have to apply on our business in Zimbabwe. So what we look at is we look at the cash that comes out of the business, uh, which is obviously EBITDA minus depreciation. We deduct the tax paid out of that uh, so that we come to a NOPAT, which we can then compare to the invested capital. We do this in each of the entities. Um, the entity that um, looks at South Africa includes cash that we get from Zimbabwe and Rwanda as dividends, but at the same time, the invested capital also includes the carrying value of the investments that we have in that business. We are not yet achieving our weighted average cost of capital for the South Africa uh, business. We are currently just below 10%. We're targeting above 15. Um, we will unpack South Africa a little bit more, but the main element that we are looking at is cost containment, because that is the element that we have under control. Uh, the volume is largely driven by macroeconomic environment um, and price increases are, of course, limited um, by, competi by competition and the intensity of competition. Zimbabwe's return on invested capital, as I mentioned, is impacted by hyperinflation and our business in Rwanda has a return on invested capital that is exceeding its, its WEC um, and therewith is in a good position to contribute to South Africa through its dividends. Now let's unpack a little bit uh, our business in South Africa first. Um, on the map, you see all the various players that you have, and you see immediately that the area that we call inland, which is in the right upper corner, and the provinces like Gauteng, Pumalanga, Limpopo, to some extent the Northwest, that is where we see the most intense competition. Uh, that is where most of the cement manufacturers have their, um, have their plants, including ourselves. Then if you look at the KZN area, uh, you see less competitive intensity. It's an area where PPC has limited presence. And then when you look at the Southern and Western Cape, that is typical PPC land uh, where we have two, two factories in the Western Cape without any other competition other than a little bit from Afrisam coming out of the middle of the country, as well as imports, of course. Um, imports, something that we have been engaging the government on for a number of years, um, especially when it comes to import that is being um, brought to our country on the basis of variable cost, so-called dumping. Uh, we successfully extended, or the, the government successfully extended the, the tariffs on Pakistan cement, and we are now working to get the same in place for Vietnam. Overall, the South African market um, is roughly 14 million metric tons. Um, and at the moment there is active capacity or, you know, uh, capacity that is truly in production of about 16 million tons, and it is about 3 million tons uh, that is at the moment idle. A large portion of that 3 million tons is sitting at PPC assets, which places us um, probably as the best amongst um, all the local producers to benefit from any uptick in demand as the infrastructures uh, will roll out over the coming years. I talked about the muted growth. I will not spend much time on this. You all know what the GDP outlook is. Um, we all know that gross fixed capital formation is growing at a way too slow rate in South Africa. However, on the other hand, there is a significant amount of projects that has been awarded. Um, and we're looking forward to those projects landing and turning into cement demand. So to give you an idea of how we're selling in South Africa, uh, we are very dependent on the retail market. Um, we have seen a significant decline in the retail market. You have seen that as well from some of the larger retailers as they publish their numbers. And um, therewith, the portion of retail in our overall portfolio has reduced from about 60 to 65 to 50 to 60%. On the other hand, we have seen the industrial segment picking up. 
Um, and there with the, the volumes are shifting slightly more to industrial products compared to um, especially the post-COVID time when the retail was very strong. In retail, most of our products go through the 50 kilogram bags that you see in the shops, whereas in the industrial segment, it goes in bulk, um, which you will see on the road, the, the large bulk tankers that bring the uh, materials to our customers. Again, we have good insight into our route to market. Um, as you see here on the slide, the various um, entities that are ending up buying our product before it ends up in the, in the end user. It is important to understand your, your market well, um, as obviously each of our different market segments has slightly different needs uh, that we serve to the different products that we supply to the market. If we um, summarize South Africa and Botswana cement in, an, in a nutshell, um, as I said, retail remains to be a key demand driver. We're happy to see some green shoots out of the infrastructure projects. Imports at the moment are a bit lower on the back of, unfortunately, on one hand, fortunately for us, a, a weak rent. Um, all these products are, of course, bought in dollars, as well as the um, unreliable port services um, in South Africa. It makes it difficult for importers to bring product into the country. Our operating costs negatively impacted uh, by the, the, the usual suspects, unreliable power, uh, power cost increases, rail services unreliable, which means that we have to move more goods over the road. Internally, we have focused on um, input costs for a while now. We do this through improving our industrial performance, as well as optimizing the network that we have and reducing what we call clinker factor. Um, clinker is the semi-finished product that we produce in our plants, and we can extend our clinker uh, with other products and there would reduce the cost of the cement that reaches the end user without compromising quality. We'll continue with our biannual price increases to recover from you know, what we see currently as cost inflation and still to recover from the past where we haven't been able to pass on all the cost increases into our price. As market leader um, and a company with um, capacity that can be easily brought back online, we are very well positioned for any upswing as and when it comes. Expect volumes to be down this financial year, ending uh, 31st of March by about 4 to 7%. Prices up by 5 to 7, so that means our revenue line is more or less flat, maybe slightly, slightly up. Our EBITDA margins, however, are weaker uh, because we had more cost increase than that we were able to pass on to the market. Our input production cost inflation is roughly 11%. Um, fixed cost and administration cost were contained at 3 to 5. Clearly, if you look at our main cost drivers being energy, the 11% production cost inflation that we see um, is, I think, a good result um, in, the, in, the last 12, in the last 12 months. If we unpack materials a little bit more, as I said, those are three businesses, ReadyMix Concrete, Ash, and Aggregates, very different businesses. ReadyMix Concrete is integral to our cement business. It's a very large consumer of cement. So when we look at the return on invested capital in ReadyMix Concrete, we always do that in combination with the contribution out of, out of cement. Ash is a byproduct that comes out of the ESCOM power plants. Um, it's integral to our decarbonization program because we can mix it into our cement and reduce the clinker factor and reduce there with the CO2 footprint and the costs. It's a very positive um, business in terms of return on invested capital, and therefore we seek to grow that business further maintaining a lean cost structure that we have today. Aggregates is a product that um, supplies materials into ready mix concrete and other concrete. Um, it's an independent business for us. We don't consider it part of our core portfolio. Um, therefore, it is important that this business generates positively uh, to the cash of the group. Um, in FY23, a lot of headwinds in that business. We're currently in a restructuring program to make sure that we get that business back um, to positive cash generation and after that positive return on invested capital. If we look at Zimbabwe, uh, we have a very strong position in Zimbabwe, total market of Zimbabwe, um, about 23 million tons, large market. Um, we have about, I would say, traditionally half of the market um, being served both out of our, our factory in the south, in Bulawayo, combined with a grinding station that we have in, in Harare. Number of competitors in the country, as well as imports. Uh, Zimbabwe, despite everything you read about it in the newspaper and the 
accounting mongly wongly um, is actually a country that consumes a lot of cement at the moment. There is a lot of infrastructure happening as well as a strong um, retail segment. Also in Zimbabwe, uh, a clear view on where are the end users and where is our product being used. You see a similar split in terms of retail and non-retail as you see in South Africa, uh, with a slightly lower overall uh, bulk percentage, indicating that Zimbabwe is slightly behind South Africa when it comes to industrialization. Very important for us in Zimbabwe is to look at the cash generation in different currencies. And it's been very positive for us that we are, we are um, selling almost 80% of our um, product in hard currency. That is largely uh, dollars, pulas, as well as South African rents. And you see that the Forex sales contribution um, has gone up from the, the time when the ZWL was introduced in FY20 to now FY23, 80%. This helps us as well in the um, ability to repatriate dividends as that money sits in hard currency in the PPC limited accounts. So far in FY23, 8.8 um, .8 million US dollars were repatriated up from 6.2 million in FY22. And we expect this number to slightly grow further in FY24. If we look back at FY23, um, we had a longer than usual shutdown of our plant in Bulawayo. The reason for that was that we had to do an upgrade of the, of the plant, both for environmental reasons, as well as increasing output. Therefore, we expect the volumes this year uh, to fall about 14 to 18%, as we are now gradually recovering our market share back to the normal levels. I already mentioned to you the, the dividend that was paid this year. Um, EBITDA margins will recover back to FY22 levels after they have dipped um, on the back of the lower volumes in this year. If we look at Rwanda, Rwanda is a small country uh, with only one cement factory, um, and that is ours, that produces both clinker and cement. And there is one grinding station in the middle of the country of a competitor that imports the clinker largely out of Tanzania. The plant that we have serves both the, the market in, um, in Rwanda, um, as well as exporting to the eastern part of the DRC, and there with providing a source of dollars, uh, dollar revenues, which is important in the, in the Rwandan context. You'll see it on this slide again, the, the route to market. Interesting to see that Rwanda is a lot less industrialized than Zimbabwe and South Africa, not completely surprising. Uh, and therewith, our backed product is 93% of our total volumes and only 7% goes through uh, bulk. Also important, as I mentioned, about 22 to 28% of our uh, product is exported out of Sumerra um, into the Eastern DRC, and therewith giving us a strong dollar-based revenue stream. Financially, very sound business, uh, strong market in Rwanda. Uh, we expect our volumes to be more or less the same as they were in, in last year. We are running the kiln at maximum capacity. We have a few projects in the pipeline that will increase the capacity. The margins in Rwanda are at an appropriate level, uh, between 28 and 32 percent EBITDA margin. Uh, and a dividend was declared, as I mentioned. And in the meantime, um, approximately 80 million rands after withholding taxes have arrived in our South African bank accounts. I touched upon decarbonization. It will take us too long to unpack all of this in great detail. Um, the main projects are around reducing our clinker factor and therewith reducing our CO2 footprint and our costs, changing from coal-fired power plant energy and electricity through renewables. We have already signed a number of PPAs. Uh, we are not investing ourselves in renewable electricity, but we support the business case through offtake agreements. We are dependent on coal uh, in our operations. Uh, we can replace coal by various waste streams. Think about tires, uh, but think about other waste streams as well. Again, a big impact not only on CO2, but also on the cost to operate. And the last one is to run our equipment um, at optimal level, something that we have started to benefit from over the last two years. And we still have further space uh, to improve in the next couple of years as well. So the key takeaways, um, we remain 
with a cost focus to make sure that our input cost inflation that we see in our business is well below what we're getting from the market and that we pass on the rest in pricing. Our decarbonization initiatives to further reduce our costs are well on track. We have good dividends flows coming back out of Zimbabwe and Rwanda. Um, all of our capex in Zimbabwe and Rwanda is externally financed when necessary so that we maintain dividends flows to the SA Obligo Group. Both Zimbabwe and Rwanda at the end of February this year were in a net cash position. So there is space there to gear up a little bit. We're achieving our optimal gearing levels at the SA Obligo Group, and we will remain very strict when it comes to capital allocation going forward. Looking forward, um, PPC very much focused on performance and returns over the last years after our deleveraging, now creating space for distribution to shareholders. The three markets where we operate, South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, leadership positions in all these markets with a strong and optimized asset base, therewith well positions across these markets to benefit from structural growth in infrastructure and other areas. I touched upon the value accretive way to decarbonize our business, touched upon the optimal capital structure and the fact that we have an experienced, focused and motivated leadership team that helps us steer through this business. With that, ladies and gentlemen, in the outlook, we're waiting for the infrastructure for South Africa to kick off, but at the same time, we're also ready to withstand the current headwinds that South Africa is facing, and we're working with all the stakeholders to address the areas that we can. We have the financial and operational flexibility to both respond to an upsurge in cement demand or to withstand the current economic conditions in South Africa. Positively looking at Rwanda and Zimbabwe, um, continue to, to repatriate dividends from these countries. And therewith, we can do both um, a initiation of distributions to our shareholders whilst maintaining our leverage. With that, uh, Marco Vanessa, I conclude my presentation and I'll hand back to you for the Q&A. Excellent. Thank you so much, Roland. At this point, I'm going to hand over to the finance ghost and to Mark Tobin, who will facilitate the Q&A. And as a reminder, please pop your questions into the chat function. Over to you guys. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Roland. That was an incredibly cool presentation. I certainly learned a lot from it. So to our attendees, yes, please do pop the questions through into the chat. Don't be shy. Uh, Roland, I'm going to ask you something that I want to understand a bit better. Someone who's not that familiar with the cement industry, actually, just the concept of clinker comes up a few times in your presentation. There's an economic effect. There's obviously a carbon effect as well. I think the carbon effect is, is relatively easier to understand. Maybe just from an economics perspective, I'd just like to understand a bit more about, you know, clinker versus finished cement, those products, you know, the impact on margins, just maybe a couple of minutes just to help people understand how those things work together a bit better. Sure. Sure. So if you look at if you look at cement um, and you would be able to take it apart, you will find that in a cement, the clinker content varies between 40, 45 percent um, up to 90 percent. Uh, the more clinker content, normally the higher the performance of the cement is. So obviously, if you build a building that is uh, 70 stories high, you need stronger cement than if you build something that is only one story high. There is no cement at the moment uh, that does not have any clinker. Um, clinker is a, as I mentioned, semi-fabricated product. It's coming out of our big um, kilns. It's the limestone largely that we that we burn, highly energy intensive, and therewith by far the most costly part of the cement. Um, after clinker, you will then put in things like uh, fly ash, for example, a little bit of gypsum, all all at a much lower cost than the clinker itself. So it is key for us that we reduce that amount of clinker in the cement as much as we can, maintaining, of course, all the quality parameters. Thank you. Uh, can I just get uh, a question in, Ron? You talked a lot about, you know, the the prospect of dividends or share buybacks, uh, you know, as part of a future capital allocation. Does that mean then that, you know, as we look at PPC going forward, that organic or inorganic expansion in, in any of the markets that you operate, whether it's the South Africa, Botswana one, Zimbabwe or um, Rwanda, even though they're self-funding, but if they wanted to do something bigger, you know, they might need a, an injection from the parent. And um, are those kind of 
major expansion opportunities off the table for the time being, given PPC's history? So our focus clearly on Southern Africa. Um, if there were opportunities for inorganic growth in our core business in Southern Africa, we would certainly look at it. Um, but any M&A activities in terms of growing our footprint outside of Southern Africa is off the table. Got a question here, <laughs> Sam from Boring Investment, which I think is hilarious because PPC is many things, but it certainly is not a boring investment. And the question is, um, what is the expected impact of the upcoming elections in Zimbabwe, potentially on the performance coming out of that investment? Any concerns there? It's obviously a geopolitical question, uh, given Zimbabwe's history, not an unfair one. Just some thoughts around that. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, and it's not an easy one to to answer. Uh, you know, Zimbabwe has a has an element of unpredictability. Having said that, um, you know, from working with a lot of the Zimbabwean stakeholders, I must say that, <laughs> funnily enough, it is easier to operate in Zimbabwe than it is in South Africa sometimes uh, when it comes to having positive collaborative. Um, conversations with members of government, uh, both when it comes to supporting industry um, as well as finding finding ways to make sure that we can continue to to repatriate dividends. Look, I, I have the crystal ball. Um, many things can happen, but from where we stand now, um, the operating environment for an industry like ours in Zimbabwe, funnily enough, or actually very unfortunate, is almost easier in Zimbabwe than it is in South Africa. Uh, Roland, and, uh, just when you mention, um, you know, Zimbabwe and, and Rwanda, can you just talk a bit about how PPC is managing the, you know, foreign exchange risk and repatriation risk um, of dividends from those two um, markets, you know, because I think everybody will have seen, you know, how this can go wrong with, uh, you know, the likes of MTM and you, you end up getting you know, funds trapped on the other side or there isn't dollars available to, to change it over. So maybe just give people a sense of, you know, how you're trying to mitigate some of those some of those risks in terms of now that they are actually going to be, you know, returning capital back to South Africa. Yeah. Um, so starting with, with Rwanda, um, it was our first experience and it must say that, you know, Rwanda lives up to what I claim. It is a country where um, foreign investors are welcome. Um, and they understand that foreign investors would also like to repatriate. I mentioned in my presentation uh, that we do sell about 20, call it 25% um, export, and we generate dollars with that. So obviously it is important for us to maintain that. It's, I think, a strategic advantage that we have in Rwanda that uh, a quarter of our revenues are in, are in dollars. Um, Zimbabwe, 80% now is in, in hard currency, um, and it has now for a number of years not been a problem uh, to use those funds to repatriate dividends. We're obviously watching extremely closely uh, that we continue to generate dollars. But you're right, it, you know, if I look at uh, the business that we had, for example, in, in Ethiopia, um, you know, those, those elements are a major concern. Um, and part of the reason that we have said we focus our resources on Southern Africa has actually to do with um, risks that are associated with the, the possibility of repatriation. I must say, Roland, I'm still reeling from this news that Zimbabwe is sometimes an easier place to operate than South Africa. But, uh, you know, I'll pick myself up off the floor here. Um, and the next question is a little bit more South African, which is around um, the infrastructure rollout, you know, comments around what you're potentially seeing on the ground, your expectations, timelines, you know, the story. Everyone's always interested in what you are seeing at ground zero um, in terms of that sort of demand. Yeah, so you know, what makes me optimistic is the projects in Lesotho, uh, so the big dam projects and, and related works. There's active tendering going on now for, for cement, um, which is nice to see. We see more and more uh, some of the infrastructure projects in the Western Cape um, coming off the ground, also now looking for, for tendering. And then we've seen a number of road projects. Um, another area that is still quite active is housing developments. Actually, that is an area that is keeping us quite busy at the moment, you know, with, uh, with the reduction in, in retail and the big infrastructure project not yet coming up. The housing segment is, is an important segment for us at the moment. And everyone, just when you mentioned the segments there, um, 
In terms of you know the ability to push through price increases, which one of those segments is you know the hardest to get things through? Is it you know dealing with you know whether it's you know the Department of Transport or Sandrail or you know the likes of you know Builders Warehouse and you know those kind of groups are you know the the, the property developers themselves um, who you know who kind of pushes back the hardest in the in the current environment. Um, <clears throat> look, I think everybody is pushing. Um, the most difficult customers, I don't know, most difficult, I think, you know, with different groups of customers. So you touch your large, large industrials, uh, they obviously have a procurement department that, you know, needs to demonstrate their value. So they like to commoditize our product. Uh, very often in this industrial environment, it's interesting though, because the technical people, they very much like our product um, and would not be so happy to switch from um, from ourselves to someone else or vice versa. Um, then you have retailers, uh, sort of the, the cash bills of this world. Well, enough, the retailers, they don't really mind price increases. For them, it's actually a, it's a networking capital help because they buy on credit terms with us and their business is cash. So the higher the price, the bigger that networking capital impact. However, for them, it is important that you know prices are are more or less at the same level amongst the competitors uh, because it draws traffic into their stores. So if the competing store has a cheaper cement on the shelf, they lose they lose traffic. So that makes them conscious of price. We're not dealing directly with government. It always goes through um, construction companies. So we don't have direct experience with the sunrals of of this world. So I would say you know overall, usually it is the industrial segment that is probably most price price sensitive, but at the same time they're also most quality uh, sensitive. Yeah. Roland, just touching on that, and, and the other thing that I found interesting today is you must be one of the only companies in South Africa that actually is a net beneficiary of Transnet's issues, you know, as opposed to the mining companies can't get stuff out, you know, the importers can't get stuff in. So it's really interesting to, to learn about that. And what I wanted to ask you is, well, two questions. First one, for people who don't necessarily have much experience with the sort of international trade tariffs and these other issues, you know, how is it possible that cement from Vietnam can end up being, you know, cost competitive with something made right here in South Africa? So just a little bit on that. And then the second question is, are the imports equally damaging for you across client segments? Or are there specific areas, specific, I mean, you've talked to the regions, but specific types of clients where you find it's a bigger issue than not? Yeah. Um, first of all, you know, unfortunately, we are not a net beneficiary from Transnet. We're suffering um, like everybody else because we move a lot of stuff um, on the rail, or we like to. Imports, um, yeah, I, I used to run a global trading company um, in Klinker and Cement, so I, I know pretty well how this world works. And normally you would build a cement plant of, let's say, you've got 1.5 million tons of capacity. Um, if that cement plant sits nicely at the coast, uh, which is the case, for example, in Vietnam, Thailand, uh, United, um, so Dubai, that sort of area. And let's say you sell about a million tons on your local market. You've got 500,000 tons uh, that you will have freely available. You've already invested your capital. Um, you know that your fixed costs are quite high. So you are willing to sell that at a variable cost plus concept. So take variable cost plus a dollar, uh, maybe two, maybe three dollars max. Secondly, you look at shipping, um, and a lot of the cement uses backloads of, of shipping routes. But there's a lot of um, stuff coming out of Africa in general, South Africa as well, commodities going to the east. Those vessels need to come back, um, and they're willing to take anything back at cheap rates. So not only do you get your cement at variable cost plus, um, you get your freight um, at co very competitive rates. And that enables you to land the cement um, at the east coast of the of the African continent, as well as to, to Cape Town, uh, below full cost of production in country. And to, in terms of the customers impacted, it is mainly um, retail customers that would take the product. Industrial customers are a little bit more um, concerned about you know quality of that product often varies so you take it from one plant and you take it from another plant so you've got quality variations and the second thing that industrial customers are are allergic to is the unreliability of supply so sometimes a vessel comes sometimes a vessel doesn't come uh, everything fluctuates 
So it's not a lot of stability and reliability uh, behind it. So ironically, as the retail demand has slowed down a bit post-pandemic, the import has actually become a little bit less of an issue for you in terms of just the mix? At the moment, they are for us a little bit less of an issue. It, it is largely because of the rent as well. So at the current rent, um, it's hardly economically attractive for an, for an importer to bring product in. And the fuel cost, sorry, Mark, I'll, I'll let you jump in now. The fuel cost would also affect that potentially. I mean, the, the further the stuff needs to go, the more expensive energy is, the less competitive it is to get it across the world, up country. Does that have an impact? Uh, indirectly, but the freight rates, they, they live their own lives as well. Uh, you know, we've seen a huge spike yeah. in freight. In freight, it's come down now a little bit. So it's, it's up and down. It's up and down. Countries that are exposed to a lot of imports, they basically become countries where the price of, of cement starts to fluctuate and even the availability starts to fluctuate. Thank you. Um, you mentioned, uh, Roland, Afri Sam, and, uh, you know, we've had Afri Matt on here uh, presenting as well. And, you know, their aggregates business competes with you uh, in, in, in certain markets. Um, in terms of, you know, differentiating yourself within the market, you know, whether that be against, you know, some Afri Matt's businesses or, or, you know, these new independent producers, if you if you want to want to call it that. I mean, how how do you kind of position yourself in the market so that when somebody is trying to decide between you and and another competitor that you know ppc is kind of front of mind for you know a big housing development project like you know waterfall up in up in Gauteng, for example so i think there's there's a number of them number one is the consistency of the of the supply um, and our ability to supply because we have a, a wide network, probably the only, com the only company in South Africa that can supply throughout the country. Secondly, especially when you look at um, some of the fly-by-nights, call them cement producers, is quality. Uh, we regularly test product from our competitors and you know, some of the smaller fly-by-nights, you know, their bag of cement is not 50 kilos, it's 46, 47 kilos. The strength of the cement doesn't reach a tenth um, of what it is legally um, obliged. It's simply dangerous. Now, I'm not saying that you know the only product that is compliant is uh, I would recommend equally well, you know, Afri Sam Sepaku, uh, Nafar's Mamba, even a quick build uh, as one of the blenders. You know, there are people who provide quality, but there are many at the moment, especially in the in the Gauteng, Pumalanga, Limpopo area that are mixing too much uh, into their cement and, and make a product that is simply out of spec. And uh, just on the ash one, um, it, you know, it, it, it's interesting you say it's, you know, it's a, obviously a waste product or a byproduct of um, ESCOM's coal generation fleet. Well, when it's coal generation fleet, is actually working. It's a byproduct. Um, where is it gone to the stage where you have, you know, some of the, I'm thinking now the, the big residential developers are actually requesting cement with a particular ash content because it might bring down the CO2 kind of footprint of the entire project. Are they that kind of ESG motivated that, you know, they, they want a, a kind of a cement product that has a particular content of ash or are, are we not kind of there yet in terms of um, environmental considerations coming into you know, some of the big residential guys or, or the commercial building guys who are looking for, you know, five green stars or six green stars, whatever rating they're looking for. We're not really there. Hey. So if you compare the UK or you know, mainland Europe, the US, certain states, we're, we're far behind. Um, so this is not a consideration for us. You know, that's why it's actually very welcoming that all these decarbonization initiatives are financially attractive as well. So we don't even have to have the debate, but we get very little from customers where they would insist or would be willing to pay a premium for a lower carbon uh, carbon cement. Okay. Speaking of carbon, there's a question here in my DMs around just the, you know, how energy intensive PPC is obviously, and just a question, I suppose, around renewable energy sources going forward, you know, is there something you can realistically, I mean, let me ask you, Artra, can you ever be off grid? Or are you just too much of a heavy industrial user for that to be a realistic goal? I think it would just be good to understand what is and isn't possible. Yeah, so to be completely off grid is is a stretch, um, and at the moment, still with you know where 
especially storage and battery costs are, it's probably unrealistic today. Um, we currently have a mix of projects in the pipeline where on the one hand we want to, um, and we have contracted um, out of wheeling concepts so that you know we take the electricity through the grid and the solar and wind projects can be installed at the best possible locations. And we are going to combine that with some uh, most likely solar projects on site and embed it. Um, but it is definitely possible to reduce our dependency on, on the current coal fire power plants. Uh, that I will see happening over the next 10 years, but that's across South Africa, not just for ourselves. In terms of coal replacement, um, there are many cement factories throughout the world that have um, replaced 80, 90, some even 100% uh, of coal and replaced it by waste. The reason that it is not at that level in South Africa has a lot to do with regulation. Um, for as long as it is dirt cheap um, or for free to just dump your stuff in some waste dump, uh, people are not going to treat their waste in order to um, make it available to us to process it in our plants. So that's another conversation we're having with the um, with the involved ministries in, in South Africa to say, you know, you have to put proper regulations in place so that waste dumping becomes completely unattractive. And that you actually start moving waste to energy uh, through our cement kills. And um, Ron, just an, another one for me on, on margins. Obviously, you're getting you know pressures on the cost side, and you know the demand side is you know variable, and it's hard to get the increases in in as we said on the, on the pricing side. Um, but if if we kind of look through a, a kind of a, a cycle of of five or ten years. You know what is kind of a sustainable margin for the kind of PPC business? Like, what would what would you say is like we're kind of in in the sweet spot? You've touched on the you know weighted average cost of capital, but if we if we go back a, a step from that to like you know at a margin level, what does that look like? Um, so when I started at PPC four years ago, I said this business ought to have a twenty percent EBITDA margin. Um, and I didn't say that with, with a lot of knowledge, um, and I've been kept account, accountable to that. Um, if we now run our simulations on what do we need as a margin to earn our cost of capital, we come slightly below the 20. So that 20 was not that dumb. Um, and that's overall, including our materials our materials business. Okay. So that's, yeah, true, true kind of cycle, up times, good times, uh, bad times. It, it, yeah, that's kind of the number that, you know, people should be, should be looking at uh, as yeah. you know, the kind of sustainable one where you're going to hit uh, everything you want to hit. Okay, yeah. interesting. And of course, for us, volumes are quite an important lever in that. Mm. Yeah, with the fixed cost base for sure. Exactly. I have a question in my DMs uh, late last year, National Treasury, I think it was actually the year before, unless I'm mistaken, I suppose it doesn't really matter. I think it was at the end of 2021, actually. Treasury banned the use of imported cement on government-funded projects. Did you see a significant improvement in your order books as a result of that decision by government? Or is the sort of Vietnam cement just being rebagged as, you know, Bloemfontein's finest and then sold to government anywhere? <laughs> Look, many years ago, the government also said we shall not drive through a red light. Um, and it's a bit the same. Hey, So we've said, look, the, the, the thing is, how is this going to be implemented? Um, and we see, despite the fact that we raised a number of concerns, for example, the Western Cape government said, look, who are you in, in Pretoria to tell us what we can use and what not? So they got a little exemption. Uh, we have one importer in Port Elizabeth who said, look, you know, um, uh, I've invested here a couple of years ago, so he got an exemption, and so on and so forth. So whilst we welcome the idea, um, and we're all happy about localization, and we proudly contributed to the Proudly SA conference uh, yesterday, you know, the, the actually implementation of this needs to be maintained. And therefore, we haven't really seen a major change um, in, in our projects. Positive to hear is when a Sunral actually says, look, we are not gonna allow our contractors to use imported product. For me, that's actually more relevant than, than, than the treasury. The treasury was, it was nice, we're happy with it, uh, but it hasn't really moved the needle in our business. Just a linked question to that. Would you say it's upside optionality at this point in time? Do you think there's a risk that more imported stuff will find its way into these projects? That's a tough question. It almost feels like there's only, 
Is it is it unfair to say there might only be upside from here? Really? Can it only go down or is that not right? Look, I do think that we're looking more at the upside at the moment, um, but this is short term lift. And that is actually our argument to to the Ministry of DTI as well. That we say, look, you know, don't tell us that you don't need to put import barriers in place for dumping because at the moment the rent is so weak and there's no product flowing. You know, that might change uh, in two years from now. You know, God knows China starts to fire up again and, you know, we're all happy. We get our mining products out and the rent strengthens back to 16. You know, then you'll have the imports back. For us, it is fundamentally looking at, you know, the practice of dumping um, is well recognized in international trade agreements as something that, you know, you can take action against. And um, Ron, I'll just squeeze in. I know we're pushing up on the hour, but I'll squeeze in another one here. Um, you mentioned your know, dividends, you know, are going to start flowing back to um, shareholders at, at some point in the in the not too distant future. Has the board landed on a dividend policy as yet? You know, whether that be fifty percent of cash impact or you know, some kind of cover ratio or is it is it still kind of to be determined? So it is to be finalized, but as management, we had our first interactions. Um, as I mentioned before, for us, HEPs and apps and that sort of things do not make a lot of sense. So we're, we will be looking at cash and we will be looking at that leverage ratio that I mentioned of 1.3 to 1.5. Those are sort of the key anchor points. Um, and what is surplus um, and we don't have viable projects for, we will return to the shareholders. That's that's our thinking. Great. I think we're out of time. Yeah, I don't I'm have anything more in my DMs. Yeah, I'm just double checking mine as well, just to make uh, and one last question is on yeah, just 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 capacity. Um, you know, if we. You know, if we get uh, a lot of these uh, infrastructure projects, you know, coming on, you know, uh, a, a kiln only has a certain uh, and factories only have a certain uh, output. But, you know, uh, have you kind of got the spare capacity that, you know, if we if we do see a ramp up in these infrastructure projects and tenders being awarded that you can, you know, kind of grow into that uh, without, you know, hitting a major supply constraint, um, you know, in the near future? Yeah, the short answer is yes. Um, and when when the post-COVID boom came, uh, we actually demonstrated it. Uh, we benefited for a couple of months where we simply could switch on this additional capacity and we'll have that back up and running in a matter of, of, of weeks. Okay, great. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, we're, well, we're a minute or two away from, from one, so I think we'll leave it there. Uh, Roland, thank you very much for a very informative presentation. Um, I certainly learned a lot, and I'm sure uh, everyone who was on the call also did. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. From my side too, Roland, thank you very much for the time that you gave to support our platform. And thank you to everyone who participated today. We hope that you've enjoyed it. And as a reminder, it'll be on the Unlock the Stock YouTube channel. The recording will be there. And we have two sessions this week. So we have another one on the 30th of March with CANS who released their results last week. So we hope you'll dial in for that. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you.